Okay. How many people got in this room because they wanted to learn how to retouch skin? Well, right? So good news and bad news. I'm going to show you how to do it. Um, bad news is, is that it's very, to do it, well, here, let me, I'm going to rephrase that. I'm going to rephrase that. So <clears throat> I've got a retouching job for anybody in this class. I've got 10 full figure fashion images. So again, full length fashion pictures, whatever. And I just want you to clean up the face on them a little bit. How long would it take you to do it? And what would you charge me to do that? <laughs> yes. I mean, like, I think I have to see the photos first to judge how much it would cost to make them go. Like, that, that, if the makeup's, like, really, really good, right. I might not have to do it. Like, if there's nothing, Right. I have to do it. No, no, and, and that's actually a really smart answer, because you, you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm throwing out this hypothetical to you, but and the truth is, is, without looking at the image, you don't really know, right? How many of you, though, if I said, okay, it's really very, very minimal, you looked at it and you thought, okay, well, it just needs, you know, a little bit of touch up here. Maybe there's one, you know, a pimple here or a pimple there or a shadow here or a shadow there or whatever, but that's really simple, you know. That's it. Then how much would you, how would you figure out what to charge me? Yes. They don't, so usage is an interesting topic. It exists in photography, but it is not for retouchers. No, it's just like hair and makeup people don't get usage. Models do get usage, but nobody else in the game. Producers don't get usage. Nobody else in the game gets that. Um, so the rest of you. So let me ask you this. Would you figure it on time? Is that how you would try to figure it out? Yeah, you would look at it and you say, okay, it's going to take me, what, 15 minutes an image to do that. You know, that's going to be generous, right? You know, because it's just minor cleanup. I'm not asking you to make people bigger or smaller or, you know, cut them out or comp them into anything. I'm not asking you. That's just, you know, minor touch-up, that kind of stuff, right? So 10 images, 15 minutes a pop, that's 150 minutes, right? So that's just a little under three hours, two and a half. So let's just call it three hours, right? And I'm 50 bucks an hour, $150. Does that make sense to you guys? So that means sort of like that would kind of work, right? So if that's how you really feel about retouching them, my suggestion to you is, is that you go on to eBay and you find the slowest, oldest possible Macintosh that you can lay your hands on. The thing that's going to take you hours to do this instead of minutes to do this, because if it takes you 10 hours instead of two and a half hours, then you're going to make, again, at $50 an hour times 10 hours, you're going to make, you know, 500 an hour for, for the job. I mean, again, Basing things based on time encourages you to be as slow as you can possibly be because the longer it takes you to do it, the more money you make. I think a much better plan for doing this is to actually look at the image and say to yourself, okay, it's going to take me 15 minutes to do it. I will do it for, again, 50 bucks, you know, so it's going to take me two and a half hours to do it at 50 bucks an hour, or let's, or let's just say three hours. 50 bucks an hour, it's going to be $150 to do it. But then if you can get it done, the entire thing, if you spend like a minute or two on each image, well, let's say you spend two minutes, that's 20 minutes for you to do the entire project, $150 for 20 minutes worth of work. That is $450 an hour is your rate. Much better plan, don't you think? So the reason I'm bringing this up is twofold. Number one, don't ever quote anything based on time. You hamstring yourself, and it just means that the longer it takes you to do something, the more money you'll make. And nobody in the world wants to work that way. Much better off to think in your mind, well, basically, how long is it going to take me to do this, and what's that really worth? And then lay that down and hopefully just quote them a rate. Okay, your 10 images, I can do it for $150. I'll do your 10 images, minor touch-up. Does that sort of make sense to think about it that way? So that's the first thing to think about in terms of how to do it. The second thing you need to go into, and this I think goes back to really more your point in the beginning, is, is that different retouching projects call for a different amount of time involvement. So I just gave you a quick case scenario. 10 fashion images, full length figure, that kind of stuff. How much? Just a minor cleanup, right? That's very different than me doing a retouching project of Rachel Weiss for L'Oreal, right? So L'Oreal comes to me and says, okay, we want you to do this picture of Rachel Weiss. It's going to be our signature flagship, you know, image of this new eyeshadow that we're doing here at L'Oreal. It's going to go worldwide and we're going to do it for two or three years, blah, 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 blah. How much time are you going to spend working on that mother? 
Well, it's not going to be 15 minute retouch. I can promise you that, right? You're going to go in, you're going to spend, people who do that kind of retouching, they can spend weeks, if not months, on a single image. So that's a completely different animal, right? At that stage of the game, you'd be thinking, okay, well, I'm looking at this now. Realistically, this is going to take me a week to do. Again, for me, a week at $2,000 a day, five days, 10 grand. They're not going to bat an eye at that. So the point that I'm trying to make is, is that your retouching is largely dependent on its intended use, not on usage, but again, 10 full length fashion images that are, you know, you just need a little sort of touch up here, there, whatever, is a very different animal than a headshot of a movie star that you have got to go in and basically deal with it on a poor by poor basis. Does that sort of make sense, everyone? So, what I'm going to show you today is the Rachel Weiss L'Oreal makeup version. We all know, yeah, well, I'm going to start at the extreme because this will, this is going to, this is interesting, people's reaction to how this ultimately works. So, I should hold off and we'll wait and have this conversation next week after you have to do the assignment for today and sort of see how it goes. But uh, nonetheless, I think you just, you need to keep that part in mind. So, I'm going to show you the most difficult of retouching today the most time consuming, but clearly the least destructive in the way that, again, it's the highest of high end retouchers. This is how they do this stuff. Um, then as we go deeper into this, we will get into faster, quicker ways that would be sort of uh, uh, maybe more generalized how you would want to retouch. And the thing that I'm never going to ultimately touch on is probably how all of you guys retouch right now. So how many people will you go into retouch an image, you go right after the either the clone stamp tool or the heating brush tool, and you just start whacking away? Yep, absolutely not gonna happen in this class. It's the worst possible way you can retouch. It is destructive on every single level, um, and ultimately, you know you go in and you see those uh, uh, pictures at, uh, at like, well, you can go to anywhere from Sephora to, to Neiman Marcus to you know Walgreens, and you look at the, you know, the, the beauty pictures that are in the cosmetic section, and there's nothing real about any of those. Plastic skin, plastic face, plastic everything. They're horrible. That's because somebody actually used the clone stamp tool and the healing brush tool to do all their retouching work. So we're going to get away from that. Um, that's not to say that, again, down and dirty, the same job I offered you in the very beginning. I've got 10 images I want you to do, and I got uh, 50 bucks. Will you do it? And you think to yourself, 50 bucks. I haven't eaten in two days. Yep, 50 bucks. I'll do it. And you go grab the healing brush tool and smack the shit out of that stuff, and hand it right back to me and say, "Give me my 50 bucks." And I would, and I would uh, expect that. So, so again, as much as I'm saying and I'm putting those tools down, um, uh, I'm just trying to get you out of that mindset. Uh, okay. So, with that being said. Um, we are going to start looking. There's one other thing I want to do first really quickly though, and that is to recap the whole um, uh, um, uh, zero selective color uh, action that we worked with last week. So if I can get everybody to go into, uh, it doesn't really matter which one image we do, but <clears throat> there's an image in, let me see what's in six right here really quickly. Maybe we'll actually use one of the images in here. N you, there's no reason to save it. I mean, you don't need to. Uh, there's no reason to save it. Um, so let's do. Let's do. Yeah, if you go in to. Oh, okay. Let's go into. So, um, in your student uh, uh, for session number six. There is another copy of that headshot that you just worked on for your assignment. So the 0810, uh, yeah, 08 ver underscore fashion underscore uh, copy dot tiff. That should be in your session number six. If you can simply open that guy up in Photoshop. Um, the other image that was in Photoshop, the composite they were working on, you can close that up. You don't need to save this. If this does open up like my tiff just opened up here, it opened up in camera raw. That's kind of deceiving in the sense that Camera Raw is really designed to process raw files, but Camera Raw can also actually process files that are already processed, so it can actually work on a TIFF file. All of that is controlled in this. Uh, if yours just opened up into Photoshop, you're fine. Just go ahead and leave it there. But in my case, I go back and forth in how I treat this. Um, if you go up to the little gear at the very top and you come down to Workflow, you can actually, I take that back, not workflow, file handling. You can disable support for uh, Camera Raw. So right now it says mine is set to automatically open TIFFs with settings in Camera Raw. I can change this to disable TIFF support and say okay, 
and now if I hit cancel out of here and then simply go back to that same file and double click on it it will open up into Photoshop not into camera raw so just realize that those options exist I'm gonna close up the girl in the woods I don't need to save that that's all done I'm gonna double click on hand just to get it as big as I can get it then hopefully all of you saved that zero selective color action so I'm gonna ask you to find it in your actions palette scroll down again we're looking for zero selective color when you find it Again, make sure that, take a look at my screen right here, you can see, I'm going to go to my drop down menu. You do not want to start here in one of the children's steps. You want to start at the parent step. So you need to select zero selective color and then you simply click on the little arrow that is at the bottom of the actions palette that's pointing to the right and it will run the action. In my case, it does it correctly. It actually built a hue saturation layer and then it added a selective color uh, layer on top of it. Um, and then all of the sliders have been taken to black. If your image worked pretty much right, but it looks more like a solarized image like this, it's because your radio button was not set to absolute, it's set to relative. Just click on absolute and you'll be good to go. So what we did before, sorry, I keep, I'm always paranoid about if I've got a recording going or not, I do. Uh, okay, so what we did before when we were working on this um, is that we simply did the drop down menu and went to the greens and then took the black slider, the blacking slider. Remember, what, what we did with all of these sliders is that we said we want you to take the greens and fill it with black ink and do the reds, fill it with black ink and the yellows, fill it with black ink and the highlights, fill it with black ink and the shadows and all of that. It was all filling those with black ink and that's why we have a black image. Everything got filled with black. But now if I go to the green section here and I grab the slider and go all the way to the opposite direction, now what I'm saying is I want you to fill the greens with white ink. Everybody else is black, but this is with white. I don't get a real white background on this because my green in this image is not a pure green. To amp up the purity of the green, you can select the hue saturation layer that's underneath it, grab the targeting adjustment tool, come down onto your image, onto the part of it that is green. Don't do this on her, but do it on the part that is green. If you click and drag towards the right, it saturates your green. If you go to the left, it desaturates your green. Once I've completely desaturated my green, the image goes black again because this is now no longer a green. This is actually a gray midtone. But anyway, I'm gonna go in the other direction and I'm gonna pump it up. And so this works great for actually beginning the beginnings of a knockout here, right? And so this is how I do all of my green screen stuff. And so you guys, however, this tool. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, what? So this is how we begin the process for a knockout. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that this tool does so much more. So instead, I want you to grab the uh, hue saturation layer and double click on the saturation part to return it to zero. Go back up to the selective color and take the black slider for the greens all the way back again so that you've got your black image again. If this is not working for you, you can throw both of those layers away and simply run your action a second time. It doesn't really matter, but you need to start with a black image again. Everybody got the black image? Okay, instead of going to the greens, I want you to go to your drop down menu and come down to the whites. And then I want you to drag that slider all the way back. What is this? Say what? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So just watch what's going on right now. You'll see. Uh, there's nothing that we're doing right now that is, this is not about retouching. But what is this? So the whites are highlights. So this is a highlight mask. Right? Think about this. All of this image that is black is not highlights. This area that is on her, the top of her head right here, that's the lightest of this, the whites of her eyes, those are the whitest. It's really showing that part. As we start to move into down into the quarter tones, that's what's happening in this area of her face in here. By the time we get to the mid tones, this has gone black again. And by the time we get to the shadows, this is totally black. So this is a highlight mask. If I use this, I'm gonna save it. So simply come over to your uh, channels grab on the it doesn't matter which one you grab this is a black and white image now you can grab the green the blue or the red channel it doesn't matter they're all identical i'm just going to drag the blue down make a copy of it i'm going to double click on it and i'm going to call it highlight highlights then i'm going to go back over to i'm going to select the very top again my rgb thing at the very top i'm going to take my black slider for the whites in my properties panel for the selective color and i'm going to take it all the way back to black my image is now black again i'm going to now go down to my blacks and i'm going to drag that slider all the way to the right what is this this is a shadow mask aren't these all my shadows dark hair dark eyelashes the pupils of her eyes so again, I'm simply going to grab any of my channels. This time I'll grab the red one, drag it down, double click on it, call it shadows, and say okay. Go back over to my selective color and drag it all the way back up again. Go up to the very top, make sure that you're selecting the very top of your RGB channels. Um, and then I'm gonna do the drop down here for my neutrals. And I'm gonna drag that all the way back. What is this? This is a mid-tone mask. I'm not going to work with the mid-tone mask. I'm just going to stick with my highlights and shadows. But do you see that what we're doing here? This is a way to select and target areas. We can target other colors. I can target the reds. If I wanted to get a red mask in here, I'm going to drag my black slider all the way back up again. If I want to go and pick just the reds of my image, come up to the reds and then grab that slider and drag it all the way back. This is all the reds of my image. You can see I've got more red in her mouth. I've got a little bit in her face and none in the background. This is a red mask. Make sense? This one will really trip you out. Every one of you should take your friends to the bar tonight because it's really, well, it's nice weather right now. It's gonna be shitty later on. But say, by the way, I bet you I can make a mask you've never seen. You buy me drinks all night. And they'll go, okay, because everybody, you guys are hungry for information. I know you all are. That's why you're here, right? So let's try this. Go back to your whites. Grab the white slider and drag it all the way back. Then go down to your blacks. Drag that slider all the way back. What is this? This is a highlight and shadow mask all built into one with the midtones missing. I can promise you none of your people have ever seen that. But at any rate, you can throw these away now. They've done their job. We're going to actually use one right now to see what it really looks like. So I am going to put a solid color layer on my image. So just grab solid color. And in the solid color, I'm going to pick a dark blue. So I'm going to click on the blue part of my slider. I'm going to type in 255. And we'll just keep it as this really radical blue because it'll be easier to see it. So I'm gonna say okay to that. So this has got a mask on it. So this is a tricky thing that you guys need to, this is a great skill set to, re I wanna actually use my shadow mask on this, but I've already got a mask on here. How do I do that? So people come in here and they'll look at the shadow mask here and they'll think, okay, well, I've gotta load that and then I gotta come over to my layer mask and I gotta do all that. Don't do any of that shit. Simply throw this layer mask away, delete it, Come over to your shadow mask that we just made. Hold down your uh, uh, command key. Click to actually load it as a selection. And then come back over here and we are simply going to add it as a layer mask. And you can see now, it's only putting these uh, that blue in my shadow area because that's the mask that I actually made. 
Now, this looks, you know, this is a very Beatles poster, Richard Avedon. You guys know the posters that I'm talking about? Yeah, it look, that's, and they did a version of this back then, but that was pre-digital, so they all did this by hand. But to make this more believable, change the blending mode of this color layer from normal down to color anytime here. This is now going to colorize that part and then simply use your opacity slider to drop this back down. And you can see, you can go in and to start to, this is how you would start to split tone an image. So this is now actually using my highlights. How fast did I just create that? <coughs> Shoot. This is an incredibly fast way to build these sort of like luminosity masks that will actually allow you to do really detailed stuff like this. I've, this is all on autopilot for me. I didn't have to go in with a brush and paint this shit in and control where it was and do all of that kind of... I didn't have to do any of that stuff. This is all just based on luminosity. Make sense? All right, you can close this guy up. We don't need him anymore, her anymore. <coughs> The next one I want to go after is there's a, um, a, a file in your session number six called clonehealing1.psd. If you could open that guy up for me really quickly. And then again, double click on the hand to get it as big as we can get it. So is everybody able to find that file? Okay, so we're going to start with the easiest parts of all of this. I'm not going to go too deeply into a lot of these tools. Um, most of you guys already know this stuff. If you have a trackpad, you definitely, I'm sorry, uh, um, a graphics tablet today, you definitely want to have that guy available and ready. We're not going to necessarily use it right now, but we are going to use it in just a minute. So I just want to make sure everybody's good on that part. So the first thing I'm going to start with is <clears throat> we're going to go through the clone stamp tool and the healing brush tool and talk about what things are and how they work and all of that kind of stuff because most people if I were to say for instance in this class how many people can tell me the difference in the healing brush tool and the clone stamp tool what Yeah, well, there's parts of what you're saying are absolutely right, but it still doesn't really get to the heart of how they are different. Anybody? Yes. No. All right, so we're just going to look at it. But again, inherently, this is part of the problem, right? You guys are mostly seniors getting ready to graduate. You've worked with these tools for years, and you have no idea what the fuck they do. <coughs> So we're going to talk about what the fuck they do because then how we use them going forward for everything is going to matter. You're going to know which tool to pick and why you picked it for what reason. So again, 
That's going to be the goal today, actually, and the rest of uh, when we talk about retouching later on, all the retouching that we're going to do. So we're going to start with the clone stamp tool. It's the S key is the shortcut for that. So if you just hit the S key, it'll take you there. If you click on the drop down menu, you'll see you have a clone stamp tool and a pattern stamp tool. You want to make sure that the clone stamp tool is the tool that you've actually selected in this. Immediately, it is a brush. Your eye should go up to the menu up at the very top. I'm going to click on the drop down menu. I'm going to make this a completely hard brush. I want to really be able to see the edge of my clone stamp work. The blending mode, clone stamp tool, and healing brush tool both depending on the healing brush tool you're using have limited blending modes the healing brush tool i'm sorry the clone stamp tool has a full range of them the healing brush tool is far more limited anyway uh, opacity is 100 percent and flow is 100 percent and we're going to come over onto this image and the minute i come over into my image i get a circle with a little slash through it how come it's telling me i can't clone why what Exactly. So I've got my second layer is selected, but the eyeball is turned off. It can't see it. So there's nothing to clone. However, I don't want to start with this, the top layer here that's the, got the half circle in it. I'm going to start with the one underneath it. I'm going to click on my background layer. And now when I hover over it, I do get a clone stamp tool. I'm going to use the bracket keys just to the right of my P key to make my tool a little bit smaller. And then I'm going to start up in the sort of the top right hand corner of my image. And the way the clone stamp tool works is this, is that you establish its source first and then you go to the destination and the destination is what you're trying to change. So uh, you pick the source and you say, okay, this is what I want to then use to replace something else. So to set the source, hover over the top right hand corner, hold down your option key and click once. That establishes the source point where you're actually going to be. Oh, we should also talk about the other options that are up in here. Uh, as we continue to go across here, so 100% flow, 100% uh, opacity, you can leave angle, and we don't need to deal with airbrush. You can leave angle at zero, but you want to make sure that aligned is checked, and then sample in the drop down menu. This is going to be current layer here. You can have current and below are all layers, and we'll talk about what that is in just a minute. So again, I'm going to hover over that corner, hold down the option key, click once. That sets my source point, and then if I hover over my image, you should see a preview of what it's going to do. So you can see right now there's a black dot in there. If I click and start to drag down, you will notice that there's a plus that goes all the way back in the right side of my image. This is again showing me my source and then my destination is actually changing it. So as I start to work my way down on this and you continue to work your way down on this, you'll see the source starts to get into the lighter area of my gradient and it's starting to get lighter in my image. And then by the time I get all the way down to the bottom, it's gone into the light area of my gradient and I'm good to go. Yes. I'm sorry, what? Did you set a source point? Did you hold on the option key and click? And then you actually need to start the clone before the plus shows up. So Command H, again, hide things, hides extras, it hides the source point as well. All right, come back up to the top again, right next to the place that we just did it, and click and drag down again. And you can see, as long as we continue to do all of this, that everything lines up perfectly, it goes back. Basically, I've completely aligned my source to the new area that I'm dealing with here you don't have to keep it that way. If you uncheck this aligned check mark up at the very top, and then I'm going to actually start in the middle of my image right here. When I start in the middle of my image right here and click and go down, every single time it returns to the original source, which is up in the top right hand corner, the black area. So now I'm actually painting a completely different version that's coming down here. If I come back over to the top of my image, I'm not going to do the top of my image. I'll do the middle of my image right here, sort of where it's in light. I'm going to click again. Look at my source point. It always goes back to the original part. That's not true if you keep that aligned checked. The reason this matters to us is that when we're doing some retouching, when we're looking to like replace texture in an area, sometimes you'll find an area of your skin or, or, or whatever, skin or, 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 or barn wood or, or, or 
or asphalt or anything that's got texture in it um, sometimes you'll find this perfect area of texture and you can use it over and over and over again by actually using this trick so that it always goes back to the original point. Does that make sense, everyone? Well, yes. So go back here to the very beginning, go in your history on the very top and just restart everything. You can just exit open and click the bottom one now to actually do this part. So then again, so if come back over here, we're going to set a new point. Pull down the option key, come back over at the top and click and drag down. Good. And then let go, start down here and click and drag down. No longer line. Does this make sense, everybody, what just happened? All right. Uh, I'm going to go back up to the very top of my history palette just to undo everything and just where I've got open and then I'm going to click on the background layer again to continue to work on this. You can control how this tool works in different ways. So if you come up to your window menu and come down to clone source, this again is a control that we don't keep open a lot, but if you need it, you can have it. So in the clone source, once this opens up, you'll see up at the very top, you've got uh, one, two, three, four, five clone sources here. All of these will stay active. Not only will they stay active, if you've got an image open, so for instance, here, do this, do this. Uh, do Command N to bring up the new dialog box. You should still have that eight by 10 dialog box, the original one that we made to actually do the um, uh, choking and spreading. Just go ahead and say okay to that and come over to your image right now and start to clone. This is now cloning from another image. Make sense? You can then go back to your original image, the one that's got the gradient in it. You can select your second clone source. So again, that's another one that's up here at the top. And I'm going to come over now and sample part of the gray. So hold down the option key and click. And then I'm going to go back to that other window, the one that I just made. And now click and drag out another line. And I'm now cloning the gray that was in this background. But if I click on my number one clone source again, it will go back to the gradient. I know. Crazy, isn't it? So you can close up that second file that we just opened up. We don't need to save that. I just wanted to show you that these clone sources, you have up to five of them. They can actually work in between images. That part I think is really strong. I love that part. If you look down in the bottom of your clone source tool, there's a thing that says show overlay. If you uncheck show overlay and then come over to your image, you can actually see um, you don't get the preview anymore. But if you click and drag down, it will still work, but you don't get the preview anymore. Um, that can actually help people, some people out if you're trying to do very specific targeting. Because the problem is that when you bring your clone source tool, if you have overlay on and you bring this over onto changing a source, it covers the source. So if you uncheck it, you can really spot where you're trying to cover the source and then you can be very direct and very specific about where you're starting, where the center of your source is made, meeting this, uh, the center of your destination and click and go down. I'm gonna go command option Z twice to get rid of those two. You can also leave overlay on and simply drop the opacity down. So if you bring the opacity down to like a 50% and then come over here, you will get a bit of both. You will be able to see through the clone source. So this is now not showing as a solid black. It's allowing some of that to go through. So this would also allow me to do very precise targeting. But now when you click and drag down, it's not the, uh, it's the opacity of the overlay that it's actually been changed the tool itself still works 100%. Does that make sense? We good on that part? Okay. Command uh, uh, Z to undo all of that. I want everybody to turn on the circle now that's on the very top. Uh, go ahead and leave. I'm going to crank my opacity of my uh, uh, um, uh, overlay all the way up again. So in this stage of the game, again, I've got my, uh, uh, even though I've turned on another layer, I'm going to click on this other layer, the second layer, because I'm actually going to work on this. I want to complete the uh, arc in here. But you can see right now my source number one is still selected. So if I click and drag this now, it's still the gradient because that's my source number one. I'm going to hit Command-Z to undo that. 
Instead, I'm going to set a new source point. So I'm going to put my uh, cursor down on to uh, uh, about like a 1.32 o'clock. If you imagine this is a clock face. I'm going to hold down the option and I'm going to click. And now I've actually set a brand new source point for my clone source number one. And you can see if I come over to my image right now, I've got, this, uh, I've got part of the arc. But if I click to actually bring this arc down right here, it doesn't complete my circle because it's doing an exact inver it's, it's, it's an exact version of my source point I'm putting right down here. And so the one o'clock, the, you know, the curve is actually going from sort of the, the outer out part of, is bowing out towards the right and it still is down here and I need it to be the exact opposite of that. So I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that. You can actually change the angle of your cloning. So if you look at your clone source, the angle adjustment that's sitting right down here, you can slide, you can go across that. We're going to change it to 180. And now what will happen is that you can see your clone source point that you had at that one o'clock has now been flipped 180 degrees. And now it's more going to line up to complete my circle. The problem that I've got is, is that this is really finicky about how you where you need to be to actually start to do the source point. Because again, it needs to be exactly 180 degrees over from here. With my brush this small, it's too hard to see. But if you make your brush much larger, you'll actually see there's a way that you can start to actually change over the value of this. Sorry, I clicked the, that. You can actually start to work this into your image till you actually get it to the place where the top of your source lines up and the bottom of your source lines up and then simply click once and you've now replaced or finished the circle. You wanna fuck with your name, with your friends, with your roommates that you hate? Go into the clone source right here flip it to 180 and then just close it up because none of them know not i i would bet the bank there's not a single student in this college that knows about clone source angle but you all do so again another i'm trying to do everything i can to get you guys free drinks at the bar for the whole rest of your life and there's just a litany of things like this that say by the way anyway uh okay questions about any of this please change your angle back to zero or your computer will be doing the shit that you don't want it to do. So anyway, um, I'm going to turn off the top layer again. I'm going to close up my course, my source, uh, uh, clone source part. I don't need to see it. So I'm simply going to drag it away from being docked and then click on the little X up at the top. You'll notice now when I come over to my image of the background, the original gradients one, it's still holding on to that original clone source. It was the one that we selected that was at the top of the circle part. I need to reset it. I'm gonna make my uh, brush a little bit smaller first. Um, actually, I don't even need this tool. I'm gonna go straight into the healing brush tools right now. So that's clone source in a nutshell. If you go to the healing brush tools at the very top, you'll get a drop down menu and they've really expanded these things out now. So in the initial healing brush tool, up at the very top, you have a spot healing brush tool. What this tool does is that Photoshop picks the source for you and then you just pick the destination. That's all you do. The remove tool is a new tool in Photoshop. We will talk about remove tools later on. It's, in my opinion, it doesn't really belong here in the healing brush group um, because it's removing things. It's not changing anything it, or it's not healing anything, but nonetheless, this is where they put it. The next tool down is the healing brush tool. This was the original tool in the group. This tool, if you click on it, it allows you it, this. In, in this case, it works very similar to the, uh, uh, the uh, clone stamp tool in that you pick the source and you pick the destination both. But what the tool does is a very different thing. Then the next tool down in the group is the patch tool. We'll look at that. And then again, content aware move tool and red eye tool, I'm going to leave for a different time. Um, but I'm going to start with the healing brush tool, the one where you actually pick the source point and the destination. So I'm gonna pick the source point right here. I'm gonna come over again to the, uh, that side of my image. I'm gonna do the very same thing that I did before. I'm gonna make the tool much larger. In here, you do have a limited number of controls. Remember, if you click on the drop down menu here, you'll see you don't get a full set of, of uh, blending modes in this. You get some of them, but not a full set. 
You also do have a line uh, and not, so you can check a line. I'm going to actually ask you to keep a line on there. Then you can also, in your drop down menu, do current layer, layer below, or all layers, all of that kind of stuff. Don't worry about diffusion or angle right now. We'll talk about what those are a little bit later on. You do have a blending mode. I'm going to leave mine as normal. We do not have opacity and we do not have flow in this tool. If you click on your drop down menu here, you do have hardness. I'm going to actually ask you to grab your hardness and drag it all the way up to 100%. And then we're going to do the same thing we did before. I'm going to come over on the edge of, to the top right edge. I'm going to hold down the option key and click. This sets my source point. Then when I come over to my image, it looks like exactly the same thing is going to happen. I'm going to click and drag down and let go. Why didn't that change? So this goes to the essence of what's different in this clone stamp tool and the healing brush tool. So the way you need to think about the healing brush tool is this. This is why it works so well when you need it, but doesn't work at all. Works horribly when you use it in the wrong spot. So what the tool does is it's a two step process. The first step process is that it looks at the texture of my source and it replaces the texture of the destination with the texture of my source. That's the first step. But the second step that makes it very different than this clone stamp tool is that it then looks at the area around the healing that I have done. It says, what is the tone and color that surrounds this? And it takes that tone and color and changes the new texture to match that surrounding color. So what's happening here when I just did that stroke, this is a synthetic file. It has no texture in it. It's just one that I made in Photoshop. So when I clicked and did this drag down, I'll do it again. I click and do this drag down. It's replacing the texture, but the texture of the gradient is identical to the texture of the, of the solid gray. It's no different. There is no texture in here. So even if it did replace the texture, that's fine. But then it looks at the area that is surrounding it. And instead of leaving the gradient, it's looking at the area around it and saying, oh, it's all middle gray around here. We're going to make this new texture middle gray. And so it makes it all middle gray. So it doesn't look like we've done anything. The same thing happens if we do this in reverse. Cover over the top of your uh, top corner of the gray side of this. Hold down the option key, click to sample a color. Come over into your gradient and click and drag down. Again, the first step that it did was to actually change the texture. So, but the texture is identical, so there is no change. But then it looked at it and said, okay, we're not going to replace this with middle gray. We are going to look at the gradient that is around it and we are going to match that gradient tone going all the way down. That's a very different process than the clone stamp tool. I can't, there's no other way I've ever found a way to demonstrate the difference of these more extreme than this. Does this make sense to everybody what's going on? Uh, okay. You can close this guy up. We do not need to save him. You can cancel that. Don't need to save that. Make sure that I'm here where I need to be and all of this. Yeah. Okay. We're going to start your homework. I uh, know. Uh, unfortunately, we are not going to finish your homework. All right. So... If you go into week number six, session number six, inside of your assignment folder, there are, hopefully you've got four files in there. Do you guys have an assignment file, the PDF? Then you have a thing that's called skin as retouch. And then do you also have a tonal uh, retouch large reference and a tonal re retouch small reference? You've got all of those. Okay, I want you to open up the skin as retouch. And then I need to find one other file to show you. Uh, from me. Uh, the one you're opening is now. That one is, yeah. Actually, it's shot on film, scanned, but that's film. Uh, sorry, I'm looking for one other file that got it. Okay, I need everybody to look at my screen right here. Does this thing have any dimension? Flat, two-dimensional, right? How about now? Does it have dimension now? Why? 
Exactly. Shadow and highlight are what give us dimension, right? If we eliminate the shadow and highlight part, it just completely flattens out. Does this make sense? I mean, again, this is they're all two-dimensional, but this is the illusion. It's a pictorial illusion of depth or volume, and then not. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Keep this in mind. I need everybody to zoom into that pimple on this girl's face. Why do we see that as a pimple? But why do we see it? Think about what I just showed you. It has dimension. Why does it have dimension? Because there's a shadow and a highlight on this, right? So if I want to get rid of the pimple, but I do not want to do any destructive work on the image at all, can't I do it by changing the shadow and the highlight? So what we're going to do right now, this is what the highest of high-end people do. This is tonal retouching. So this is going to become a word that pretty much everybody in this class is going to fall into one of two camps. You're either going to love this or you're going to hate it. The people who love it are the people who like to do mindless things for hours on end. The people who hate it are the people who don't like to do mindless hours things on end. But no, but sometimes doing something that just, you know, takes a long time, it can be very therapeutic. You know, you can like space out and, you know, it doesn't, you know, you can't watch a movie when you do this kind of work, but you can pretty much space out. You can get all fucked up. Sometimes getting all, you know, too many drinks will actually help out your I used to think too many drinks helped out my bowling, but it doesn't. <laughs> It, it, there's like a limit you hit. You go like, you, you know, the first beer when you're bowling, you bowl better. But the, by the time you get to the third or the fourth, you're just, you know, it's, you're, you might as well go home. Right. So anyway, I don't know why I went down that road, but there you go. Okay. So in the reason that you do not want to use healing brush or clone stamp tool is this. So um, I'm going to actually, let's start this out. We're going to do this starting using the clone stamp tool. So I'm going to make a blank layer. Actually, let's not do a blank layer. Let's just make a copy of this background layer. So with the background layer selected, hit Command-J. It'll just make a copy of it. And then we're gonna, I'm going to hit the S key to get the clone stamp tool. I'm going to make the tool smaller. Uh, I'm going to leave it as a completely hard tool, and this is for a reason, so just bear with me here. Leave it as a completely hard tool. Normal blending mode, 100% opacity, 100% flow, and current layer. Uh, that's the only one we need to be working on here. I'm going to come just to the side of this image right here. I'm going to hold down my uh, um, uh, option key and click to create a source point. And then I'm going to come right over the top and I'm going to click. And I don't know about you guys, but I can see the edge of that click right there. So if I go to uh, uh, an arrow right here, this edge right here came from the source point right here. And so what's happening in here is that I don't have texture that necessarily is going to meet up with this. So you say, well, okay, Verso, but we can fix that. We'll go to a soft brush. And I'll say, okay, let's do that. Command Z to undo that. Then I'm going to again hit the S key to get my clone stamp tool and I'm going to make this a completely soft brush right now. And I'm going to do the same trick. I'm going to come over here and make my brush a little bit larger so it makes sure that it covers the whole thing. Hold down the option key, click for my source point, come over here and click to get rid of my other point. But now what you see is there is a shadow around this new part. And what has happened here is this where the brush that I'm using now starts to move out towards its outer edge, it gets softer. But what softer means is that it begins to fade, and as it's fading, it's allowing the original image to come through. That's why it's a soft brush, right? I mean, I get down to the very edges, and by the time you get on right on the edge, it's the it's 99% the original image with a small fraction, a 1% of the new source on top of it. Doing that, you are mixing old texture with new texture, and there is no way to avoid that. So you look at it and you say, well, this worked out great, I don't see it as much, but what you are doing here is you're mixing old original texture with new texture. You're putting those two together, and then you start doing it all over your whole fucking image. You destroy the texture of the skin, and there's no way to escape this. That's why people who do really high-end retouching do not use these tools like this. Make sense? Okay. I'm going to command Z to undo that guy again. 
we are going to do this <coughs> using dodging and burning. How many, how do you guys dodge and burn in this room? What are your strategies for dodging and burning? Does anybody use the dodge and burn tool? There actually are tools in Photoshop to do dodging and burn. Nobody uses them. So how do you guys dodge and burn? Or do you just not dodge and burn? Yeah, so you use the soft light layer. That's one strategy. You could actually do what I showed you guys doing dodging and burning with the castle. We could actually reprocess the file. You could throw a curve on here that made the image lighter and a curve on here that made the image darker. Put a mask on either one of those and then just slowly work your way to paint those in to reveal that all of those... Do those strategies make sense to you guys, or did I lose you on that one? Are you good on that part? But what most people do is soft light. The advantage of a soft light layer is, is that instead of having two curves that are on two separate layers, one is a dodging layer, one's a burning layer, you can combine them into basically one layer, and you're, so you're only working with one layer. Does that make sense? All right, so you need to make this layer with me. I'm going to show you a trick to make it uh, uh, fewer steps to actually do it. So we're going to start down in the, uh, 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 we're going to actually add a blank new layer on top of this. But before you click on that add new layer, hold down the option key and then click. When you do that, it'll open up a dialog box that will allow you to actually name it and set the layer up for us to be a soft light layer. So for this beginning part right here, we are going to call this tonal retouch small. Hold down the option key when you click on that add layer. You can, we can actually, well, I'll show you how to make an action for your whole retouch setup. So let's not do it, because there's a lot of other steps to do. Let's do this one first. Um, anyway, you're gonna change the blending mode in this now from normal down to soft light. And then finally, you're gonna click on the check mark to fill this soft light with neutral color. So. It's not imperative that we fill this with a uh, neutral. Uh, it'll still work if you don't. The problem is, is that um, if you want to go in and actually look at the retouching layer and see where your retouching is, if you haven't filled it with this 50% gray, you'll never be able to spot where your retouching actually is. It, it's almost impossible to see it. So filling it has no impact on it at all. So again, this is one of those cases. What happens, this is a, a, a contrast layer. So we've used uh, uh, overlay brushes in this class before. Again, those are contrast brushes. So what happens in this case right here is, is that uh, when we build the soft light layer, neutral gray, 50% uh, gray, that middle gray, 128 gray, whatever, does not show up as any impact on your image at all. Anything that's lighter than that will lighten your image. Anything that's darker than that will darken your image. So we're gonna go ahead and say okay to this. And then hit the D key to make sure that your foreground and background colors are black and white. And then we're simply, black is my foreground color. Um, I'm going to hit the B key to get a brush. I'm going to make this a completely soft brush. Uh, a normal blending mode, 100% opacity, 100% flow. And the rest you can leave it at its defaults. Make it a little bit smaller. And then working on this tonal retouch small layer, I'm simply going to click and drag a line out. And you can see it makes my image darker. Did that work for everyone? I'm gonna hit the X key to go to white and do the same thing right next to it. It makes my image lighter. So dodging and burning at its simplest. However, there's a catch in this. It not only makes your image darker and lighter, but it also actually adds the color that you're painting to the result. So here at the end, you can see this happen. It's easier to see it happening in the soft light uh, lightning layer right here. It's not only making my image lighter, but it actually is adding white to this. White is actually got no color in it. White is a completely desaturated gray. And so what's happening here, if I use white and black to do my retouching, what will happen is, is that I'll be able to actually do the dodging and burning. That part will work out fine. But I'm also adding gray to the area that I'm working at because black is a gray, white is a gray. I'm actually adding that color to my soft light layer. And the result is, the areas that I'm retouching will lose their saturation because I'm actually adding a desaturated color to it. So we do not want to do dodging and burning on this using black and white. We want to do this based on skin tone. 
So, but is this making sense to everybody how dodging and burning works with the soft light layer? All right, I'm going to hold down Command Option Z, hit it twice to get rid of all of that. Instead, we need to make a dodging and burning color that's based on skin tone. So this is how you do it. We're going to start with our, uh, it doesn't matter which one we're going to start with, so I'm just going to, right now, white is my foreground color. I'm going to click on my color picker to open this thing up. And then I'm going to look at a place that gives me average skin tone, skin color. I'm not worried about highlights. I'm not worried about saturation right now. But I'm simply going to click in this area on the lower part of her chin. And you can see that it gives me a hue of 21 in my uh, color picker. We're now looking at hue, saturation, and brightness. That's how we're going to establish this control. If I go to a completely different place over here, somewhere over here on the side of her face, I go to a hue of 23 degrees. It, the hue is not going to change that much anywhere. I'm going to do another one up here on the other side of her face. It's a 26 degree. All of this is out of 360 degrees. So the shift from 21 to 26 is nothing. So anyway, I'm going to pick one area here again. I end up with a hue of 23. However, if you take a look at this color, this is a very saturated medium tone color. That is not going to be a good dodging color for me. So to fix this, I'm going to click on the brightness radio button. So again, the B button right here, the column becomes brightness. I'm going to grab the two little arrows and I'm going to drag all, not all the way up. I'm going to drag up till I get into the low to mid 90s. Typically, I'll work around a 95, 96 percent. And you can see the color gets lighter, but there's still a ton of color in this. Way too much for this to be a dodging or a burning color. So then I'm going to click on saturation and I'm going to drag my saturation down. And I bring it down usually somewhere in the mid-teens. You don't want to go all the way down. If you go all the way down, you end up with a light gray, which defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to do here. So I'm going to leave this kind of in the sort of, again, somewhere in the low teens. And you can see what my color is that I'm actually going for here. It's an extremely light color of skin based on her color of skin tone. Say what? Did you simply click on your foreground, double click on your foreground color? So your foreground and background color in your toolbar at the bottom. That's okay. This gives us our burning color. I'm sorry, this is our dodging color right here. This will actually make things lighter. Mine defaulted to something else though, so let me do mine again really quickly. 24, boost my brightness up. Mid 90s, saturation down, mid teens. Good, say okay to that. Now I'm gonna do <clears throat> my dodging color. So pick the background color that's underneath it. Again, it'll open up your color picker tap on the same spot you'll get very close to the same hue my hue was 23 it's now 20 it's fine don't worry about that part click on the brightness radio button drag the brightness down again we're not going to go all the way down or we go to black so i'm going to go down till i'm getting sort of into the mid-teens for my brightness and in this case because we are so dark we're really losing saturation i'm going to boost my saturation up and i typically will put this in the sort of the mid 50s you'll see it gives us a little bit more color to work with i'm actually going to hit the brightness and drop it down even a little bit more here so that seems a little bit better to me and I'm gonna go ahead and say okay to that this now gives us our dodging and burning colors to work with 
Oh, so the dark one here, I've got, again, my hue is 20 degrees, my saturation is 47, and my brightness is about 11. So now when we do our dodging and burning, we're actually going to be making things lighter and darker, but we're also adding color. But the color that we're adding is her skin. It's based on her skin. So you won't see any change in that. You'll only see the difference in the highlights and the shadows. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. You need to watch me do this. Do not do this on your own right now yet. I want to actually work through all the steps of this just to make sure everybody's good on this. If you're working on a laptop like I'm working on right now, it's very difficult to do the next thing I'm going to show you. If you're working on a big monitor or a second monitor, you have all the real estate in the world to do this with. But what you'll find in doing this work is that in part, you need to be very close in on this because I'm going to go after this pimple. You need to be close to be able to do the work on that. But the problem that you will run into is that you can actually get blinded to what you're doing, zoomed in. And this is a zoom, this is a 300% zoom in on this. You also need to see this pulled back out. And you want to be able to watch this progress happen pulled out uh, at the same time. So it doesn't do me any good to make a copy of this image. So if I come up to my image menu down to duplicate this will make a copy of the image for me right here but it's a completely separate copy so even though i'm back here i can do all sorts of dodging and burning here but it won't change this other image at all because they're two separate images instead what you want to do is i'm going to get rid of this guy you want to come up to your window menu down to workspace i'm sorry down to arrange so up to the window menu down to arrange down to new window for skin eyes retouch. This is now not another image. This is the same exact image. It's just another view of the same one. So now I can actually push this off to the side. I can actually start to work on the pimple zoomed in here, but I'll see the result on my zoomed out image over here. That zoomed out image is maybe a little too zoomed out. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. That feels a little bit better to me so that I can really see a better idea of what's going on here. And then I'm going to start to work on the pimple here. So here's the trick. And these are going to be the settings that you're going to use for all of this. This is a pretty serious tonal retouch that we're going to do here. So to set up your brush to do this retouching, you want to make sure that it is a completely soft brush. Again, unlike using a soft brush with a clone stamp tool where you're mixing texture i'm not affecting the texture here at all i'm strictly affecting tone and color here that's not texture at all so i can use a really soft brush i don't need to worry about that part make sense so i'm going to do that so anyway it's going to be very soft brush i'm going to leave it as a normal blending mode we've done a little bit of work with opacity and we've done a little bit of work with flow i'm going to suggest if you're relatively new to using a graphics tablet you do not use flow for this now once you get really good at this most people will abandon using uh, opacity and only use flow for this but it's tricky to begin with so i'm going to ask you please do not do this with flow please do this work starting out till you learn it working with opacity so i'm going to drop my opacity down to six percent for skin like we're doing right now, relatively aggressive right here, 6% is a really good place to be in here. As we start moving out to other retouching that's even more subtle, you'll get down to working with a 1% to 2% opacity. And you'll say, well, that's not going to make any difference at all. It makes a shocking difference, and it will take off on you so quick, you won't feel like you can control it. That's why we're working with these so incredibly low. If you do get in an area that actually demands a little bit more and you're getting impatient, go ahead and pop your opacity up to like a 9%, but you're never gonna go above 15% in any tonal retouching that you do. Not if you care about it. But anyway, 6% is a great place to start. So this is how I'm gonna do mine. <clears throat> I'm gonna keep my left hand on the X key because the X key will actually shift me between dodging and burning. So again, the darker area here is going to burn something down. The lighter area here is going to lighten it up. So I'm going to go for my darker area first, and I'm going to make my brush about the size of the head of that pimple. So I'm trying to bring down the tone of the white that's in the very center part right there. And here's the trick. This is why you guys all had to rent out these tablets. 
How you use this tablet is incredibly important to doing this kind of work. Most of you guys are have spent your time doing brush strokes on this kind of stuff, coming in and actually doing little circles with it or doing streaks with it or brushes that you do not do any touching, any retouching like that at all. This is never a click and draw line. This is never a streak line in here. The only thing, I'm gonna do this on the back of my tablet so that it doesn't actually happen to my image. The only thing you do on this is tap, 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 tap. It's never anything but that, not ever. What you're recreating is the way pixels actually work on your screen. They are these discrete little dots if you click and drag, you will get edge lines where you drag and they will show up. You don't want to do that. So even if we're doing a line, you'll see it happen in just a minute. Even if we're doing a line, you are tap, tap, tapping all the way across the line, tap, tap, tapping all the way across the line. Nothing but tap, tap, tap. Try to do that with a trackpad. Your hand will cramp up in five minutes. You won't be able to do it. Try to do it with a mouse. Your hand will cramp up even faster. Doing a graphics tablet is the only way to do this, Liam. Oh, no, you can go back and, I mean, surely you could, but right now I don't need to start with a snapshot because right now this is my base. You, there's no reason not to do snapshots to protect yourself along the way. Yeah, because that's extending your history is basically what you're saying, yeah. I'm not really a Nazi about that part because the thing is you can go back and forth. If you overshoot the burning, you can simply start to dodge it back. I'll also show you how you can erase it if you really screw it up. All right, so that's what I'm gonna do here. So I've got my cursors a little bit here, so just watch how I do this part. So tap, 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 stop. Even though you can still see it's lighter, you need to actually take both of these and move them sort of towards one another. So I'm going to hit the X key to get my dodging color, make it my cursor just a little bit larger, and then I'm going to start to tap the area that's around this. Again, I'm tapping the whole time. X key to your uh, burning color in the middle. X key, dodging. Look at your image over here. You can see on the image, you can still actually see this overall thing. So what I'm seeing now is that I've got them balanced, but the entire thing is a little too dark. That's why I'm actually still seeing it on my zoomed out image. So I'm gonna make my brush a little bit larger about the size of this. It's still actually my dodging color. And then I'm just going to start slowly tapping that whole area back. What? then turn so once you get through all of this i'm going to close up my zoomed out guy right here turn off the eyeball does it look like i did anything on mine oh that pimple is gone well you need to keep working at it Again, if you turn off your soft light layer, do you see any change? Is this working for you guys? Yeah, okay. Hang on. So right there you can tell which camp Haley's gonna actually be in. It's not going to be the mindless do this shit for our camp. 
It's gonna be, oh really, I gotta do this. Okay, I need everybody really quickly to go up to, focus guys, focus guys, focus guys. I need everybody to go up to this girl's eyeball. So underneath her eye, you can actually see, so I'm looking at her right eye now. That's where I'm gonna work here. You can see that there's a couple of really fine lines that are underneath her eye. Now in most cases, that's not necessarily something that I would knock out, um, but in, yeah, I did. Um, so her left, our right. <clears throat> so in most cases, this is, it's a real thing. Um, I would still take it out. Uh, and then if I wanted to later after the fact, I can put it back in. I can use, use a layer mask on this to actually bring it back in or bring part of it back in, all that kind of stuff. But I want to show you how to actually go after lines like this. So again, I'm zoomed into this part. I'm going to make my brush much smaller to actually get close to the size right here. But this is what I was saying do not do. So I've got my <clears throat> dodging color right here. If you click and you drag along this uh, and you do this long enough, you will develop a line. You will see the edge of that line and it goes all the way across this. You do not want that. So this is still tap, 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 tap. It's just dots. So I'm gonna hit Command Z to undo that and show you the better way of doing it. So again, I'm just tapping along here. I'm running down this whole part. Tap, 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 tap. Oops, I've got my little button set to the hand. Tap, 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 tap. Again, if you get really frustrated with this, you can try bumping this opacity up to like uh, eight, nine possibly in here, um, but be careful, this thing will take off on you. Don't let your impatience take you off. So right now you can look at this and say, well, Versa, that didn't do dick. You haven't done anything here, but look at this. Turn this guy on and off, and you can see this gets rid of the line. If you hold down your Option key and click on the eyeball of your tonal retouch layer, you can actually see it. That's why I said we need to do this on that uh, gray background. You can sort of see what's going on in here. And you can take a look at my edge here. You can see that's not a painted line. That is a series of dots. And the entire edge of this on both sides of it is organic. And therefore, it blends in. I don't see it. If you try to click and paint a line, you will actually see that edge. You will not be able to miss that edge. Does this make sense, everybody, what's going on here? Okay. We're not done yet. Hold down your option key and click on that eyeball again. It'll turn everything else back on. If you take a look in this very same area, I'm gonna go just above it. There's a little white dot that's sitting right up here at the very top. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit more. It's just underneath her eyeball. It's this little white dot right here. If you guys can actually see that part right here. Um, I, my brush is about that size and make it just a little bit bigger to actually go after this guy So again, I need to get rid of the white dot. So this is going to be a burning thing So again, I'm gonna hit the X key to make get my burning tool in the foreground right here And I'm just gonna start tapping like crazy on this and I'm gonna keep tapping 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 and I'm going to keep tapping, and I'm going to keep tapping, and I'm going to keep tapping, and I'm going to keep tapping. Is that the retouching you want to do in life? No, it is not. The problem that we have here is that there's nothing to burn. I'm trying to burn down white. White has got nothing in it. There's nothing to burn in here. So in this case, tonal retouching will not work for this part. We can't use tonal retouching for shit like this that's on the extremes. The opposite holds true for dodging. If it's completely black, you can do this forever. The problem that I've got now to compound this even worse is that I've got this halo that's around this thing. So again, if you hold down your option key and click on the eyeball, you'll see what it looks like, what we did here. I've got this black dot that is on my image and it is never going to do what I needed to do. It's just made things worse because it's put that halo around it. To fix this, hit the L key to get your lasso tool circle this, come up to your edit menu, down to fill, and in the drop down contents, go to 50% gray, normal blending mode, 100% opacity, and hit okay. This simply returns it to the 50% that was there to begin with. So Liam, to your question, if you need to undo this stuff, you paint with 50% gray, or you fill with 50% gray. So watch what happens, I'm gonna undo that. I'm going to show it to you in real time so you can see it with the image. So this is the image part right now, and you can see that halo that's around it. 
I'm going to fill this with 50% gray on my layer. So again, edit, fill, 50% gray, and it just gets rid of that mistake. Oh, Shoot. No, like right now it's for like uh, those steam retouching. You have specific software that professional would use. Yeah. So spend all your money and buy those softwares and good luck. So select, you're working on your soft light layer, right? The soft light layer is active, right? Hit the L key to get your lasso tool and just circle the area. And then up to the edit menu down to fill and pick 50% gray in your drop down menu and say okay. Okay, so we need to actually do this work on a retouching layer on again, the tools that I told you you're never gonna use, we're gonna use one right now, but we're gonna use it in a very specific way. So what we need to do here is that this layer right here, that's my number one layer right here, it's the same thing as the one that's underneath it. I haven't done any work on it. This tonal retouching is just all on top of it. I'm gonna double click on that layer number one name and I'm gonna call this pixel retouching because that's what it's gonna be. So on your pixel retouching layer, you can do the things that tonal work cannot do. So tonal work cannot ever take that little white dot and burn it down enough. That will never happen. It can't take, there's other black dots that you'll see. If you look down on the image a little further down in here, you can see, well, there's this thing right here on the side of her cheek. I call it a cigarette burn. Um, we're going to deal with that in a second. But there's areas around in here, I'm not seeing any right off the bat that I feel like are too dark to actually go after that. But there are little other areas around here that are too light. These little white dots around here, we'll never get those. So we need to actually go after the clone stamp tool to actually fix this or the healing brush tool, either one. So <clears throat> for me, I'm going to use the healing brush tool. So again, over on your menu, coming down, not the spot healing brush tool. That's where Photoshop actually picks the source for you. We want to actually pick our source here. So I'm going to do the healing brush tool. And then if I come over here onto my image, I'm going to make the tool much, much smaller. Uh, I'm actually going to click on the drop down menu. I'm going to change this to a 50% hardness on this brush. Uh, I'm not too worried about mixing texture here because of the next thing that I'm going to show you. So if you're working on an image like this, <clears throat> um, actually it's gonna be easier to see this with the clone stamp tool, so let's start there. Hit the S key to get the clone stamp tool. And with the clone stamp tool, again, I'm going to leave it at a 50% hardness. I'm gonna say okay to the, the blending mode, I'm going to leave it as normal right now. And I'm gonna come over to her eyeball right here and I'm actually going to hold down my uh, option key to click on, so I'm, I'm gonna work just in her people. I wanna get rid of the, um, uh, the highlight, the catch light that's in her eye. So I'm gonna click on the area that's the dark part of her pupil and I'm gonna come up to the top and you can see it works really well. However, if I take that same source point and I come over to the side of her, I'm gonna resource again. If I come over to the side and go on this lighter part over here, it actually does the same thing over on that part right there, although that did not work. I'm what? No, no, I'm in the clone. St oh, actually, I am in the spot healing brush tool. That's why it's not working. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back here. I really thought I had the clone stamp tool there selected. So again, I'm going to make the clone stamp tool smaller. Hold down the option key. Click on the source. It covers the black. So it, it makes something that's darker, but it also does this part over here. Whatever. It just makes everything, uh, in this case, darker. I want to restrict where this tool really works. So I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that. Command Option Z to undo the second one here. So what you need to realize about this tool is this. If I actually set this blending mode, I'm gonna change the blending mode of this brush and I'm going to select it and I'm gonna set it to lighten. Now when I actually do my source, so I'm gonna again set my source right here in the dark part, but now when I actually paint over the uh, um, uh, uh, white part of her eye, nothing happens because I've restricted my brush to only make things lighter. I'm trying to take this black color and put it on that catch light. Well, that's making things darker. So my blending mode can really restrict where I go and what is changed. Does that make sense, everyone?
All right, so I'm gonna hit Command Z to undo that. Instead, I'm going to do this, working on this, I'm going to do this using my healing brush tool. This little white dot right here, I need to make it darker. So if I change my blending mode from lighten down to darken, which is in the top group, then when I actually do a clone stamp on this, the only thing, if I'm sampling, if I'm setting the color, my source color really close to this, and then I hover over this, the only thing will change is that white. None of the area that's right next to the white will be changed because the area that's right next to the white is going to be the same color as my source. So the only thing I'm changing is that white dot. So I don't run the risk of mixing old texture and new texture. No matter how soft my brush is, the only thing that's going to change will be anything that is lighter than my source. So I'm gonna hover over this area very close to this, hold down my option key, click as my source point, and then simply paint over that. And you can see the whole thing stays far more organic. It didn't, it actually, there's a small variation of tone that's inside of there. All of that actually changed and to my benefit, it stays real. Questions about this? All right, the final thing that I wanna go after while we're on this pixel retouching layer right here is the cigarette burn. And we need to take a look at this. So down here on the lower part of her cheek, you can see where a makeup artist has actually tried. There's something on her face. I have no idea what it is. Um, but nonetheless, they tried to fix it with makeup. So it's this big area right here. You can't do this tonally. The problem with this is, is it's not only tonally off, but the color on this is off as well. The color of the foundation that they were trying to use to hide this, all of that is off, right? So then I need to ask myself, what do I want to use here in terms of the... Um, uh, the 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 um, uh, uh, the retouching tools. Do I want to use the clone stamp tool or do I want to use the healing brush tool? Well, then ask yourself, what is it we're trying to do with this area? Am I trying to just replace the tone and the color from a different source? Is that what I'm trying to do? Or am I trying to replace the tone? I mean, sorry, replace the texture and then have it mix into the color and tone that is around it. That's what I'm trying to do. So which of the two tools is it? Is it the clone stamp tool or the healing brush tool? It's the healing brush tool that's just screaming to fix this part. So to use the healing brush tool, we're gonna do three different versions of it so that you know what these tools all are and that's will set us up pretty good. We're do actually doing pretty good time-wise. If you click on the little uh, Band-Aid here, we're gonna start with the spot healing brush tool. So this is where Photoshop actually picks the tool uh, for you. However, how you use this tool matters here considerably. So this is the thing that you need to keep in mind. So what I said was is that this is actually going to replace the texture and then it's going to try to look at the area around it and pick those colors and tones and blend in the new texture to match those colors and tones. Look up at my screen and tell me what I'm doing wrong right here. So I'm going to just do this. What did I do that was wrong? Say what? Oh, no, but that's in this one you do drag. You paint with this one. This is, not, uh, uh, this is not tonal retouching. But what did I do? I left this remaining bad tone and color sitting right down here. The tone that got blended into this is the bad tone. So the trick to this is, I'm going to Command Z, you've got to hit this whole thing in one stroke. You cannot do part of it. You cannot do the top part and then the side part and then the bottom part. You've got to hit the whole thing because otherwise you are going to grab bad tone and bad color and blend it into the partial thing that you corrected. So look up at my screen. I've covered the entire thing in one stroke before I let go. And now it's pulling in color and tone from around it that is all good color and tone. So I'm gonna come over to my history thing now and I'm gonna do a snapshot of this. So I'm gonna click on my snapshot and I'm gonna call this spot healing and say okay. And then I'm gonna hit Command Z to undo that. The next tool that I'm gonna go after is the healing brush tool where I pick the tone. So I'm gonna pick the healing brush tool here. I'm gonna make my, tool, my brush a little bit larger here. I'm going to actually look at this and say, what do I want the texture of this to be? 
So if you look at the area that's on top of this, it's got a lot of sort of bump texture in it. It's beginning to move into this problem area that I've got right here. But if I look at the area that's down on the lower part, there's better texture down here. I don't want to come and pull texture out on the side. Not only has this got hair on the outside right here that it'll put in, but also this is actually her face is beginning to curve away from me it's beginning to fade out of focus. So as I start to move on the side of her face, it doesn't have the same focus as this spot that's right on the front of her face. So you need to think about the area that you're picking as your source. It needs to be the same depth. It needs to be the tone or the texture that you want it to be. All of those things play into this. So I'm gonna set down here. I'm going to hold down my option key and pick a spot down here and then come in. And again, you need to do the entire thing in one shot. Otherwise, it's going to blend in bad tone when you let go of it and it does its matching of tone and texture. So I'm going to then do another healing, another uh, history snapshot of this and I'm just going to call this healing brush. Uh, either that or just paint over the whole area before you actually lift your uh, um, uh, stylist off. Here, I'll show you really quick. Uh, right here below. So I sampled down here below. I'm coming up here and I'm covering the whole area with my brush. I'm scrubbing along the whole thing. So the size of your brush doesn't matter as much. Okay, one final thing I'm going to do in the healing brush group and it is the patch tool. So if you go down, it's the last, not the last one down, it's the fourth one down called the patch tool. The patch tool works different than any of the other healing brush tools in here. In this case, what you do is you select the target first. You select the destination first, and then you drag your selection to a source. So I'm going to circle completely around. It works just like the lasso tool. I'm going to circle this complete area around here that needs to be fixed. Then if you hover your cursor over the inside of this selection, you'll see you get the patch tool icon with arrows that are pointing saying go out. I'm going to click and drag this down to the area that's down below. Now you can see that it's replacing the texture. This is the tool. This is now a, a, a healing uh, tool that's actually having it split apart. You can see that this is going to change its texture. But look at how dark that tone is up in the very top. But when I let go, it's actually matching that tone up at the very top. And this is the final one. I'm going to history stamp and I'm going to call it patch tool. And say OK to that. Command Z to undo that. Command D to deselect. Now you can see which of these tools did the best job. Go up to the very top of your history palette. You have the spot healing brush tool, click on that. I can spot that spot healing brush tool with both of my eyes closed and my back turned to this. Can't you? Look at the screen right here. I can fucking see that a million miles away. Horrible. If you think this is good retouching, you've been lying to yourself and all of your friends and you certainly will be lying to a client when they look at that because they'll spot it and they'll say, what the fuck is this? And you'll say, what? I don't see anything you will never work for them again. Not good. Healing brush tool, let's try that version. Much better. You can go back and forth between the two. Spot it, don't see it. Spot it, don't see it. Healing brush tool, considerably better than the spot healing brush tool. I don't even know where the spot healing brush tool picked its source. No one knows. Photoshop never shows you. Then I'm gonna go down to the patch tool. Patch tool is actually still giving me the uh, outline around it. I don't want the outline around it, so I'm gonna hit Command D to deselect and do another history snapshot, and I'm gonna call this patch two. Because I can't um, make that judgment about it when I see the little marching ants, you know, going all around that. So now I can come back to my healing brush tool or go down to my patch tool. I feel like the healing brush tool is a better fix on this, don't you guys? So that's the one that I'm going to use for this, and my work is done. Questions about this? So for what? Yes. I did all three, and then picked the one that I liked the best. Does that make sense? Okay. You don't know until you try them. Yes.
Oh, so most people when they do this exercise, the people who do this well, uh, put in eight, 12 hours. Yeah. Well, what would you what 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 would you expect to have a, 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 for your day? What are you worth? Not nine dollars exactly. That's what you hope you're worth, right? So typical high end retoucher in New York is two grand a day, twenty five hundred dollars a day. Oh yeah, well it's a day. Well yeah, I, well what if this takes me five days to do? Then it's not two grand for the day. Now it's ten grand because it took me five days to do it. What if this takes me a month? People spend a month on a single image. Wait, 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 wait. Rewind here. I said Rachel Weiss, right? Famous movie actress. What do you think she charges to be the endorser for L'Oreal? She's getting paid 10, 20 million a year to be the face. And they're going to want her face retouched for 150 bucks for their national worldwide print campaign? Not a prayer. And there's probably 10 creatives that are sitting on that retoucher's ass going, well, can't you take that part out and next move that over there? What? I mean, it's just, but that's the game we're talking about here. I said high end. I didn't say cheap down and dirty. We get to cheap down and dirty next week. Yes. Not that's amazing. Okay. We got to get through this. I got five minutes. I want to show you just the last part of this. So the last part of what I do want to show you is uh, versions of this that have already been done so that you have a sense of what you're up against. So the first thing to do is go back into um, your uh, retouching folder, the assignment folder, because there's I've given you clues in here. So if we go into our retouching session six, the assignment folder, inside that assignment folder, there is a tonal retouching reference. If you click on both of those and open them up, they'll open up into hopefully Photoshop. Maybe they'll open in preview. It doesn't really matter. So this first one, total retouch small. If you zoom in, take a look at this. This is the work that somebody did to actually make this work. And this is all over this image. Look at this. Tonal retouch large. I'm going to get rid of this. This is actually, I'll show you the last part here. This is now done on a very different scale. This is to actually smooth the tone out on a large version of the skin of this. So I'm going to show you what this is really quickly on the image that we're still working on. So I'm going to go back to my skin as retouch. I'm going to create another tonal layer on top of this. If you want to, you can do this with me and just save your file because this is what you're going to be working on all next week. So holding down the option key, I'm going to click on add a new layer. I'm going to call this Tonal Retouch Large. Again, soft light layer for the blending mode. Fill it with uh, 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 neutral color, 50% gray. This gives me another image to work on. I can still use my dodging and burning color, so I'm going to use the X key to come back to my burning color. So now what we're looking at is retouching on a completely different scale. Not this really small, poor scale that we're working on here, but larger scale. So for instance, if you take a look at this edge of her cheek right here, there's a dark spot that's right here. If you take a look at her mustache area, there's also a dark area that's right in here on both sides. So for people who are familiar with makeup, the reason people use foundation is to smooth out the blotchiness of skin. That's what foundation is all about. It's to actually reduce highlights and shadows to basically being a same color. That's what we want to do here with our large tonal retouching layer to actually take out the blotchiness. But this is very different than that small tonal work. And the reason we're doing this on separate layers is that you do not want to mix the two together. Because if you spent eight or ten hours doing the small tonal retouch, and then you go in and on the exact same layer you do this large work and you overshoot the large work, then you have to start from scratch on your small stuff all over again. You throw that eight or 10 hours away. Do not do that. But so for me, just to show you what this does really quickly and then I'm gonna show you some samples and we're done. Uh, hit the B key to get the brush, make it a little bit larger brush. Again, it's a completely soft brush right here. Still that 6%, 100% flow on this. My dodging color is actually the color that I'm looking right here. Still tapping. Tap, 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 tap on this larger layer right here. I'm going to start to work on her mustache again right here. 
So then look at the difference right here. If I turn this on and off, the eyeball, on, hello, on and off, on and off. You can see what a shift this makes. Does this make sense? So finally, I want to show you an example of somebody who's done this very well. And then we're done. All tonal. All tonal. Insane. Right? This is what her layer looks like. You can't do this in 20 minutes. But look at what this did. That's just bonkers. But her skin texture is all perfectly intact. It's just perfect skin. What's the, what's the reasonable time Hang on, hang on. Let me. I haven't showed you everything yet here. So that's the detail of the tonal work here. This is her actual tonal to do her tonal retouch large to actually smooth all of this out. Look at the difference here. So hold on, hold on, hold on. This is her pixel work right here. Minor. It was the cigarette patch and a couple of little white dots. This is the whole overall effect. all done tonally so that's also a part of it we haven't gone over how to do hair and we're out of time so don't worry about doing the hair for this part of the assignment but we'll we'll look at hair again yes hours hours this girl probably put in 12 hours on this at least We'll, we'll get to how to save your site next week. Any other questions about this? <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm sorry, with the what? Let's deal with that later. Let's deal with this now. Other questions about this? Christian? You're struggling with the what part? Guys, uh, we're done with this, so you guys can uh, either stay or head out. Um, 